Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just a few moments. We're going to let everybody get settled in into the webinar. Dominic, just a few books behind you. <laughs> yeah. It's not a CGI <laughs> backdrop, I promise. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I mastered the thing of um, turning the books, my own books, so that they face you rather than it's just ah. the so the ah. sort of bookshop effect. It's just meant to be subliminal advertising, but they're too far away, so I don't think anybody can actually see them. But I, I, I know they're there, so that's what matters. Have you seen that um, Twitter account that rates the bookshelves yes. behind yes. people? Yes, very funny. That's um, fascinating. The worst ones normally, I think, are politicians because they've clearly just got books just for show. And during lockdown, they clearly had to invest in books to sort of make themselves look, you know, better read than they were. Um, That's right. That's right. Um, well, if they're like me and maybe like you, you buy so many that after a few, you know, you're, you're halfway through one and then you go to a shop, you buy a few exactly. more and then it just piles up and up and up. Exactly. So uh, we, we've got a we've got a uh, quite a large uh, crowd already. So I want to get started and, you know, uh, take advantage of all of your time this hour, Dominic. So for everyone. Hello, my name is. Justin Reich. I am the executive director of the International Churchill Society, and welcome to this conversation on Churchill's reputation today. My guest is Dominic Sandbrook, who is a top historian of modern Britain and the author of numerous history books for both adults and children. He's probably best well known for his series on modern Britain, starting with the book Never Had It So Good. He's also the co-host of admittedly my favorite podcast, The Rest is History. Dominic, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Thank you, Dominic. And before we jump right into it, I want to remind our attendees of three things. First, this is being recorded and will be available to watch on, our, on the Society's YouTube page in the coming days. Second, we will be devoting the last 15, 20 minutes of this hour-long conversation to answering questions from the audience. So please use the Zoom question and answer function to submit your questions. And then lastly, this conversation is designed to be informative, but also fun and enjoyable. I apologize in advance if you find this discussion is not as serious or solemn as you expected. Dominic is not an expert in Churchill, but rather has the expertise of researching Britain public opinion in British public opinion, excuse me, in the mid to late 20th century. So I hope you sit back and enjoy. So Dominic, with our topic being Churchill's reputation today, yeah. Let me begin the conversation by reading out a passage from a top history book titled White Heat. Ah, very good. Nice. <laughs> nice. So done. in the first. Done. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and, I, and I swear, so this is the second of the of his series. I've read the full the first one fully. And, you know, this is not a small book. So I'm in and, and small print, too. So I'm, yeah. I'm getting through it. I... Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to ask you on was was due to this passage. So it says, quote, Looking back on Churchill's funeral a few years later, the journalist Bernard Levin wrote that it had been, quote, one of the great public ceremonies of history. But its real impact fell not on the great and the good, but on the millions of ordinary Britons for whom Winston Churchill was a genuinely heroic figure. Not only did hundreds of thousands of people pay their respects to the dead man in person, but an estimated national audience, more than 25 million, watched the funeral live on television. One reported, excuse me, one reporter noted the quote, surprising number of young people who seemed to have come not out of curiosity, but out of reverence for the man, unquote. So if I can ask you, yeah. that was 1965. Would you say that if he died today, a quote, surprising number of young people would attend his funeral? Uh, yes, I think they would. Um, but I think what would be different is that today there would undoubtedly be much more, there would be a more sort of um, a more anxious public debate about the meaning of his life. Um, I think uh, something that was basically never mentioned really in 1965. I mean, the word race sort of never came up, whereas now I think it, in some, some newspapers in some circles, it would be ubiquitous. Um, I think as well in 1965, uh, even among people who had opposed everything Churchill stood for, i.e., you know, people on the left of the political spectrum who had always voted Labour, um, I think there was a, a widespread acceptance that Churchill's role in the Second World War and his status as a kind of uh, 
as a, almost a sort of semi-mythical patriotic icon, somebody who stood for something larger than himself, i.e. the sort of the spirit of the British people and resistance to Nazism and so on. I think even among pe so people who had their doubts about Churchill himself and aspects of his record, recognised the power of that. I mean, of course, it's only 20 years in 1965 since the end of the Second World War. And actually, I think that lasted... I mean, some people will disagree because this is there's no way of... I mean, you talked about public opinion. There's no way of really accurately measuring this because it's not actually a question that pollsters asked, by and large, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but I would say that that persisted, really, until the early years of the 21st century, um, maybe even the 2010s. So to sort of go back to your question about, you know, would Churchill's reputation be the same? Would the f reaction to his funeral be the same if he died today? You look at, in 2002, the BBC held a competition called Great Britons, which I always find absolutely fascinating. Um, they had a huge sort of poll of people. And, and obviously, as is the way with these polls, people gave some sort of terrible answers. Um, so some ridiculous people finished in the sort of top 20. But the BBC then got a selection of um, sort of well-known public figures in Britain, to do, each of them did a, a, a half hour or an hour long documentary that ran on prime time to sort of push the, the push their particular candidate. And what I thought was so interesting was the BBC, the person the BBC approached to do Churchill was a Labour Party politician, a Tony Blair minister called Mo Molam, who had been his Northern Ireland secretary, um, dead now, um, died young because of cancer. Uh, she was very popular with the public. Um, she actually, the funny thing was, I hope it's not ungallant to say this, but she actually looked a bit like Churchill. So anyway, she, um, she, she did the picture. Don't we all, we all at some point. Of course we? we do. Of course we do. <laughs> we all look like a big baby ultimately. Um, so, so she did the pitch for Churchill and of course, you know, in her program, she sort of said, you know, there were things she disagreed with him about. There were things he'd got wrong, all of this kind of thing. And he won in the landslide. I mean, it was sort of obvious from the point the BBC did the survey. That he would win and actually the great britain's idea was then copied by almost every other country on earth their various public broadcasters even in the united states i think pbs or somebody did something very similar um and there was very little controversy so the guardian newspaper after he won ran a sort of piece saying um oh there's but there's a dark side to churchill and it was basically just a selection of cherry-picked quotations you know 20 quotations sort of off-colour or outrageous things that he had said, but it didn't cause any great hullabaloo. I think, by and large, people accepted that there was only ever going to be one winner, and it was the obvious, he was the obvious candidate. But I think what changed after, hmm, maybe 2010 or so, and certainly obviously has gathered momentum enormously in recent years, is that it is now impossible to talk about. I mean, effectively, I'm only slightly exaggerating, um, and I think I've said this on our podcast, The Rest is History, when I say there are some circles in which Churchill is basically the man who presided over the Bengal famine, and the fact that he was involved with a, with a sort of minor kerfuffle in Europe in the early 1940s is a mere footnote to his career of saying rude things about Indians. Um, and I think that's actually, that obviously says much more about us than it does about than it does about Churchill. So, but all of that said, all of that noise, I think by and large is confined to a, a very sort of vociferous and articulate minority. And I think among the, pub the public at large, you know, Churchill's on the money, you know, his, his, the reason his his statue is sort of regularly defiled is precisely because it still has this power and because the, those who attack it know that to most ordinary people, i.e. people who don't care about politics or follow these debates on Twitter and, or, or are not interested in historiography, to most people, Churchill is still the face of, of 20th century Britain. Uh, I, I really appreciated your comment about um, vociferous minority. Um, I, so with the society, where I am now, we, we are physically headquartered in George Washington University. That's where our, our space is. We have an international reach. You know, we have members all over the world and spread over the world. And, and from my role here, I, I think I tend to agree with you that it is a vociferous minority because it's similar to the, you know, the silent majority that, that previous American presidents have talked about. Yeah, is it sure. really a, a controversy or an issue if only a small segment of the population makes it such? Yeah. Um, and do you find as a historian 
do you think that, you know, in 50 years, we're going to look back on the Twitter culture wars, whatever you want to call them. And will that be a footnote or would that be, a, like you said, a, an explanation of the society at large at that time? Oh, it'll definitely be a window into a particular part of that society. So the temptation, I suppose, I mean, the book you quoted from, White Heat, I don't want to talk about my own books too much because I know people are much more interested in Churchill's reputation than in mine. Um, uh, but uh, that book was about the 1960s in Britain. And one of the sort of guiding principles of that book was that I didn't just want to write about Paul McCartney and, um, you know, <laughs> sort of swinging London. You know, I didn't want to write the sort of Austin Powers, um, James Bond version of, of, of 60s Britain. Um, and I think that a challenge to people in the future is that when they are writing about um, this period, you know, the temptation will be, I mean, my God, what a source you just spend, you could spend entire lifetimes kind of, you know, lost in the world of social media. But the temptation will be to to dwell on that. Sorry, there's a motorbike going past my house. Um, there's a, there's a, um, the temptation will be to dwell on that and to ignore the fact that, of course, most people aren't on Twitter. And are not, you know, if they are, they're exchanging cake recipes or something. They're not kind of suffused with, um, with, with, with great outrage about Churchill's reputation uh, or about any of these other sort of hot button issues. Um, so no, I, I think that I think his reputation is still pretty resilient in Britain. And I think actually that silent majority for a historian of the sort of of a modern democratic society, you actually always have to keep your eye on that silent majority. Um, because otherwise you just end up writing about university professors and journalists with too much time on their hands. So uh, this is a great segue into one of the you know many questions I have for you, but talking about Twitter, um, for those uh, attending who um, don't know of, of Dominic's podcast, uh, the rest is history, what, six, seven, eight months ago, I forget now, last year, you and your co-host hosted a Twitter uh, contest uh, to decide the the uh, most liked or best prime minister in, in, in UK history. Yeah. And Churchill yeah. didn't win. And I think I remember you saying you were surprised by that. But but let's all have the caveat that Twitter, I think I've seen the, you, maybe you've seen the, the statistics, like 2% of all Twitter users are actually active. And yeah. of those 2%, you know, 80% are, are left-leaning people, whatever, for whatever right. six they are. Were you But why were you surprised that Churchill didn't win? Um, I suppose I thought there was probably more um i think he didn't win because a lot of people who might otherwise have voted for him would have thought it would be too predictable um mm -hmm. uh i think he i mean why should he have won if that if, if that aspect of the question is wh why would he belong in the sort of top three or four the answer to me seems obvious he's virtually the only prime minister who's become um who's become a kind of shorthand for something beyond himself he's probably the only prime minister really who has become uh, an icon, a, a sort of totem of Britishness, of, of, of British patriotism. Um, you know, the, the, there is something about Churchill as purely as a character that is that, that, that puts him, I think, in a different level to most prime ministers who, uh, frankly, you know, when we did that list, what really struck me was how forgettable most of them are. And it's a bit, it's a bit the same with, with the US presidents, so if I'm completely honest, you know, do people swoon at the thought of Chester A. Arthur? or James Garfield or Calvin Coolidge or, you know, or even Gerald Ford or George Bush senior, or, you know, most chief executives of any nation are, are ultimately quite forgettable. There's only a few, there's only a few who are remembered 200 years after their period time in office in Britain, it would be Disraeli and Gladstone, I suppose maybe Walpole cause he's the first, the general public have a vague sense that there were two people called Pitt, but they don't know who they were. Um, you know, in the 20th century, Lloyd George, I suppose, um, but but actually now, generally for bad kind of for, for promiscuity rather than for any social legislation, Churchill and and, Asper, and Thatcher and Blair. Um, so Churchill almost automatically, I think, is in that kind of pantheon of recognizability. Um, but he didn't win, of course, because as you precisely the reason that you say among people who are active on social media, I, I, and I'm. T I'm not just talking about social media, but I'm so I suppose active. If you're active on social media, you tend to be involved in public debates often more generally, you know, you're reading broadsheet newspapers and the columns and having strong opinions about them and arguing at dinner parties and all that sort of, you know, you work in publishing or you work in the media or you work in academia. Um, and what's I think happens to Churchill's reputation there is that 
it has now become so conflated with the idea of empire, which has itself become conflated in Britain. And in the, obviously, empire is not such an issue in the United States, but in Britain anyway, it's become conflated with slavery. Um, so those things are all sort of muddled together, I think, in people's minds. And therefore, to express any, in some circles, to express any aberration for Churchill at all now is, is sort of seen as tantamount to saying, you know, I, oh, I think, you know, the British Empire was an absolutely splendid thing and I can't wait to bring back the slave trade. Now, of course, I'm, I'm, a slight, I'm exaggerating, but I'm only slightly exaggerating. I mean, there are, you know, Churchill has become, there, there, there's so much sort of other political meaning wrapped up in the discussions of Churchill. So it actually, so the details of his career, I mean, you mentioned when we were talking about what we we're going to talk about in this conversation, you said all the controversies, Gallipoli, Tony Pandy, the abdication, India. But actually, the funny thing is that so much of the arguments about Churchill is never about the details of those, the, the specific details of those issues. It's about Churchill as a sort of repository of, as a, as a sort of one man culture war, effectively. And in, in would you say so to give, to give some sort of, um, I don't know, short time to those who do argue for his cancellation? Um, do you think that? For those who hold him, you know, as you know, uh, um, somebody who could but could do no wrong, and, and us, you know, at the society and our members understand that Winston Churchill said things and you know said bad, yeah. wrong things, made mistakes, was a human, failed, and that's the story of Winston Churchill, right? It's the right. fail, it's the it's the bounce back from failure. Yeah, of course. Um, but do you think that, uh, you know, on the flip side, one of the one of the things holding back. The ability to have those nuanced discussions about the details is the very strong other side saying you can't criticize him whatsoever or thus you hate you know the uk etc cetera, etc cetera. but actually you know what uh, justin i don't think people do tend to say that i mean i don't mm. know anybody who so you know i i've sort of defended churchill in print um as other people have uh but if you take probably his best known uh modern sort of historiographical advocate, and that would be Andrew Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at Andrew Roberts' biography today, not that I was preparing for the for the, for the the interview, of course. So I was looking at Andrew Roberts' biography, and I was flicking through the index, and there are so many entries for, you know, poor, poor judgments, mistakes, you know. So, so, so Andrew Roberts writes his book, which I actually thought was a tremendous book, um, in a very, uh, you know, he's clearly very pro-Churchillian. Um, but it, but even he says, you know, his judgment on this was this was a bad error. His judgment here was clearly wrong. He quotes people saying Churchill was wrong. I mean, I just don't think there are actually people out there who think that Churchill was a demigod and he didn't make mistakes because the evidence, because as you say, actually, the interesting thing is the trajectory of his career that makes it so compelling is that by the late 1930s or by the mid 1930s, he looks like a sort of busted flush and exhausted volcano. And because absolutely everybody involved in British politics knows that he has made a series of quite dubious calls. Um, and I don't think even Churchill himself deep down would have denied that. I mean, he, he was your classic kind of Teddy Roosevelt, the man in the arena, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, always making decisions, always sticking his neck out. I mean, that was his, that was his, his sort of, that was the persona that he had adopted ever since Harrow of being that per irrepressible, always there and, and often getting things wrong, but all, as you say, always bouncing back. So I don't actually think that, I, I don't think the debate is closed down by people saying, oh my God, you can't criticize Churchill. He's, a, he's an absolute God. I think it's actually just closed down by, I mean, you said something there that I thought was absolutely right. You said he was a human being. And I think that's the case with all politicians. You know, we forget they are, and sometimes it's easy to forget that they are flesh and blood human beings. And I think the thing with Churchill is, I mean, this is why the cherry picking the quotations, I think, is actually so dangerous and so misleading. Churchill said an enormous number of things, many of which were said to shock or to amuse, and they were yeah, outrageous, yeah. deliberately outrageous. And actually in that, he's not, un I mean, lots of us do that kind of thing. Most of us probably say things we don't quite believe sometimes to make people laugh or to say, you know, to tease people or, or Churchill did that. And the difference with Churchill is that people pretended to write them down. 
So as Andrew yes. Roberts says in his book, you know, Leopold, a lot of the sort of inverted commas Churchill racist quotes come from one source, Leopold Amory. Yes. Um, is Amory always right? Is he perhaps exaggerating what Churchill said? Is he misremembering? Was Churchill showing off? You know, all of these kinds of things are possible. And, um, I, I, and actually, I think the truth of the matter is we should approach Churchill as we do any other historical figure. And my personal view is that when I approach him as a historical figure, he strikes me as endlessly interesting, entertaining, human, um, sometimes ridiculous, yeah, often incredibly admirable. Um, and and I don't I don't think that's actually I, I think most people who approach him fairly would probably agree with that, as indeed most of his political opponents actually agreed with that from the 1910s all the way through to the 1950s. Do you think that um, ideology, specifically political ideology, has in the past 10, 15 years infused the study of history with an aspect that was absent previously in the sense that you, you approach a, a certain figure or a certain event, you know, one thing, one comes to mind, you know, the International Church Society puts out a quarterly magazine and one recently was about Churchill and Wales and it goes into the Tony Pandy riots. Right. And, right. And, and a Welsh historian writes, you know, a perspective that many people, I certainly didn't, you know, didn't have, which was that Churchill was actually misled by the local constabulary to bring in the, to bring in the Dukes. Bring the Dukes, yeah. Yeah. So, but have you found as a, as a historian that political I ideology is now kind of coming front and center in, in being the lens in which people approach history? I think that's a really good question. I don't think it's, um, uh, that's a tough question to, to answer in it. And it, yeah. we could, we could be talking about it for hours. I think, I think thinking back to when I did my PhD. So I did my PhD at Cambridge, um, just over sort of 20, 25 years ago. And at that point, I would say by and large, most people, most historians were clearly in Britain were on the left and most people doing PhDs were kind of on the center left. Um, but it was quite a, I would say a much more lightly worn um, ideology. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being political by the way. And, and of course, different industries as it were, do have different biases. I mean, most people who work in the city of London, I would just say are on the right. I mean, that's just how it is. Um, I think what's happened is it's not so much a political, but a sort of moral temperature has changed. So that the, the, the tone of conversations is more strident, more, uh, more righteous, if you will. Um, there is an intensity to the debates often that there wasn't 20 years ago. Um, and social media has been very bad for, um, yes. for scholarship because it means that people are reducing their views and coarsening their views almost to, to, to get onto social media. Um, but I do think as well, I suppose, I mean, this isn't sort of me ranting and raving. I mean, the, the stats kind of bear this out, that if you go back to the immediate aftermath of Churchill's death, the 1960s and 1970s, people used to do um, surveys of British institutions which is academic institutions, voting surveys. And actually an awful lot of academics voted conservative. And the reason for that, I mean, one of the key reasons for that was that their earnings were much higher relative to the rest of society than they are now. So it was in their interest to vote conservative, actually. What's, ob what's obviously changed is that conservatives or right-leaning people have become a, a really tiny minority um, in the academy. And that's not to say that, that you can't be a, a right-leaning academic, but you're regarded as a bit of an eccentric you know, the sort of people would introduce you and say, he's on the right, but actually he's okay. You know, that's kind of, um, if, if they tolerate you. So, so I think actually the conversation has become a little bit skewed academically. And that's one reason why the academic and kind of popular discourses of history are probably more out of sync now than they were 20 or 25 years ago. Um, and, and it's the sort of impassioned tone, isn't it? I think it's the sort of, you know, that if that, that that sort of almost sort of I, I don't want to say it's a kind of religious conversation, but Churchill to some extent has become you know saint or sinner, and there is this kind of rhetoric, this moralistic rhetoric that goes with this that I personally don't really like, don't really enjoy because I think you know ultimately we're all. I mean, I don't want to sound 
mock profound but we're, not only we we're, we're all sinners but also it's a completely it's actually a pretty boring conversation to say let's just list a guy's faults um and and i think with churchill to me churchill seems the classic example of a character that if you don't a, a, approach him with a sense of almost a relish at, at tackling this great what is he he's not really shakespearean or or, or dickensian he's just he's just himself he's just churchillian if you don't enjoy that if you want to approach it with this sort of attitude, which is everything must be problematized, to use the jargon, um, then that just seems to me a quite a joyless. I mean, don't don't study history. That's yeah. that's basically my 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 feeling. So before we get into you know your thoughts about these controversies, and then as I told you, I'd love to have a, a very short lightning round of asking you questions about you as an individual, because I think our, our our audience always love to hear more about our our guests. So. I'm, Social media, you bring up, I mean, it, it, I have a young child, I'm scared. And when I say I'm scared, I'm scared of the, the almost infantilized discussions, binary, good, bad, mm. of, what, of what social media and its immediacy in the brain brings to those who use it. And as you know, someone can get canceled on social media, and at least in that realm, they can never be spoke of again. Right, of course. My question yeah. is, as a historian, somebody who studies modern history, it, I mean, you said it. It seems like social media is bad for the study of history. Would you Would you agree with that comment? Yeah, I think I probably would. So um, Tom Holland, my co-host of The Rest is History, um, often says, um, sort of privately, I mean, he said it publicly as well, but he often says social media has been terrible for historians because they rant and rave about contemporary politics on social media and you realize what well, you know, they've written the most wonderful books, but you realize that in real life, they're complete idiots. And I think, um, uh, I think there's a definite element of that. I think there's an intolerance that social media has encouraged. I mean, it's in us already, but social media has brought it out. Um, I mean, I sort of think back to, uh, the seventies and eighties, the periods that I've studied most recently. I mean, there were some very intemperate columnists in Britain in public life who would, you know, they'd go onto TV and they would they would be sort of delivering great tirades about Mrs. Thatcher pro or anti or, or, or whatever, or the Falklands War, or all these kinds of things. But there wasn't, you know, if one of them said something that everybody considered absolutely ludicrous or, or outrageous, there, there was no means of cancelling them. Yes. You know, um, the, the, the very concept would be unthinkable. I mean, I suppose their newspaper could have fired them, but but they never did. I mean, it wasn't how things worked. Newspapers didn't respond to popular pressure in that way. Uh, and certainly nor did academic institutions by and large. So, so yes, I think it is. The terrain is much more, is, is much more dangerous now. Um, I mean, the classic example, I suppose, in Britain of a cancelled historian is David Starkey, the historian of the Tudors. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, now you could argue in some ways, uh, David Starkey, um, even more than Winston Churchill specialized in making outrageous pronouncements and deliberately outrageous pronouncements. I'm not going to say, oh, he was asking for it because I think that's, sure. that's true. Sure. But, but, you know, he was deliberately walking a tightrope and he fell off the tightrope, you know, the, 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 the cultural mood had changed to be irreverent or outspoken about race and slavery was utterly you know to, to most people working in the media had become unacceptable and so he fell off the tightrope and he was cancelled but that was that it's inconceivable that, that could have happened 10 or 20 years earlier and of course as you say it is quite worrying because you see there is this has to be part of you i think that thinks there but for the grace of god go i you know i have to make sure that if i go out and have a few drinks i don't go online afterwards that kind of thing the the one especially when you're talking about history, you're talking about some of these issues about wars, empires, mm. you know, there's so much suffering in history. Um, often, if you're studying it, and if you're talking about it all the time, obviously, there are times where actually, you probably are, when you're with your friends, going to be, you're going to make a joke about it, you're going to be irreverent. I mean, the same way that everybody knows that doctors or nurses have to let off steam. Um, but the, the danger now, of course, is that letting off steam in an insensitive or foolish way will, will, will mean the end of everything. And I think that is quite a, a frightening thought. I mean, I think anybody with children actually basically dreams of a world without social media in which I their do. child will never be, you know, I, I used to say to my 
to my um to my wife you know i pray that facebook and twitter are kind of uninvented um but when we enter the 2020s but obviously they never will be yeah well uh dominic let's talk about a few of the controversies surrounding church's legacy you know this society uh we we we, we discuss all things churchill his right. faults his failures of course we have we have a strong belief that he had a net positive on the world <laughs> But we, we do encourage scholarship and research. Um, and, you know, one, in the past couple of years, we've really talked about Indian independence, mm -hmm. the Bengal famine. But, you know, I don't want to get into the intricacies of, of those, was it right, was it wrong, because you're not a Churchill expert. But, but what I want to do ask you is about putting those things into context and how important it is for historians to say the Bengal famine was a massive tragedy of World War II, a massive tragedy. Yeah. You know, millions of people die, starve to death. Mm -hmm. However, I have failed to find one strong argument that blames one man for a natural famine and then also blames one man for the Japanese blocking the ports in Burma, thus blocking the, uh, the, the grain shipments into Bengal. However, he is, you know, touted as the one person who has caused yeah. these millions of people to die unfairly. But from a historian's perspective, you know, with the nuance, that is that must be what a historian tries to do is provide the nuance and the context. Of course, it's enraging. I actually find that incredibly enraging, the, the, the foolishness of it. Now, that is not to say that Britain handled the Bengal famine perfectly. I mean, no. first of all, no government ever handles anything perfectly. Um, the even had there been no Second World War, you know, would the government have uh, have have made a brilliant fist of it and you know nobody died i mean who's to say famines happened as we know um they were not un, they were not unheard of in india um the british government in india was by the standards of of imperial governments it was it's not bad but it's not perfect um i think obviously as you say the key issues that happens during the war and the the issue of shipping so yes. actually my co-presenter Tom Holland's brother James Holland, who's a historian of the Second World oh, War, incredible historian. A whole kind of sec, a whole sort of essay about this, about the fact that even if the British had had the shipping, um, the the exigencies of the war uh, and Roosevelt and the Americans, the fact that they were involved in Sicily and they're about to um, land in Italy, meant that actually there was no way they could have used it anyway. Their allies wouldn't have let them do it anyway. That's that, that's getting into too much of the nuts and bolts. The bigger issue is, I think if it was anybody but Churchill, the conversation wouldn't be happening. I think it's the fact that it is... So in other words, if Clement Attlee had been Prime Minister... I mean, here's the thing. Clement Attlee was Prime Minister during partition in India, in which millions of people yeah. died. But obviously nobody says, oh, Attlee is personally responsible. Attlee is a genocidal maniac. Um, Attlee, by the way, as people were saying on the in the chat, is the person who did win the... Um, the rest is history's World Cup of Prime Ministers. I mean, I yes. think Attlee, Attlee was a tremendous fellow... Uh, but he's not perfect. He makes lots of mistakes, made mistakes in partition. But I don't think, OK, well, let's condemn him to the sort of the, the, the deepest, darkest circle of hell. And obviously, with the Bengal famine, it seems to me plain common sense that Churchill, who is in London and is his attention monopolized by the war, by the struggle against Hitler, Mussolini and so on, and indeed Japan, um, the you know, to hold him personally responsible in this way seems to me absolutely ludicrous. Actually, yeah. and I, and, I don't think any historian, any sensible historian can really can really do that when it's something so complicated, involving so much complicated, by the way, machinery of government. So not just the British government, but Bengal, India, yeah. the other states, all of this kind of stuff. I mean, it's obviously an incredibly complicated issue. And to reduce it to this one man morality play, I think, is bonkers. And, to, and uh, you know, as a historian, I, I'm not a, a, a historian. Uh, Per se, but I I do let primary source documents lead me in my in my quest. A primary source comes from a mem a telegram that Churchill sends to Admiral Wavell, who is then Viceroy Wavell. You must do all you can to help these people who are starving. And this is October 1943. Yeah. So that doesn't sound so so to meaning that I think when it comes to Churchill and many other, as you said. Uh, historical individuals whose name alone causes controversy. Right. The evidence in the primary sources are second to um, the the accusations of. So so when so when you present say oh well the Bengal famine 
Churchill, there is primary source of him telling Vice Roy Wavell to send more grain. That is co-opted by, well, Churchill called Gandhi a half-naked fakir. Right, of course. Which, and, and so, but, but that has nothing to do yeah. with, the action, with his actions. Yes. But it is said, oh, but because he felt that way about one ind individual, he thus has no regard whatsoever to the human yeah. lives of, of millions. Well, of course. I mean, it's, he said disobliging things about Indians because he was frustrated about Indian, about the Government of India Act. And, you know, he, he, he often said disobliging things about anybody that he thought threatened the British Empire, which he loved above all things. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't then for mean that he's sitting there, as you say, it's, it's deranged to say, well, obviously, Churchill was planning this from the start. And, you know, he, he hated Indians. And he, I mean, that's, I don't think any reputable historian, if they looked at the evidence, would would make that claim. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So let we'll move, we'll talk about one last. Oh, you know, I I might as well continue on Indian in the yes. sense that you bring you bring up a really great point that the partition of India happened under the watch of Clement Attlee. Again, nobody assigns blame to him for millions of deaths. And the reason, one of the many reasons, documented reasons that Winston Churchill was against. Indian independence, or at least out of the out of the dominion status, was that he was what turns out to be correctly fearful of the religious violence religious violence that would take place between the Hindus and the Muslims. Yeah, and I'm not. And again, it is a fool's a fool's errand to say, "Well, I told you so" in history, but it was one of many. And and another reason that he, that he didn't want to lose India was, yeah, he was a staunch imperialist. That is not to be debated whatsoever. Um, so Indian independence, I just appreciated your, your comment that technically it happened under Attlee and he's not, you know, he's not the person who's- No, who's and, and it would be, and it would be mad to say, oh, Attlee is a terrible man. We should, you know, I mean, I, I would never say, I mean, Churchill himself wouldn't have said that of Attlee. You know, he was a, he actually used to defend Attlee when other Tories- Yes, he did. Um, uh, sort of said, oh, Attlee is an, a, a nothing, a mediocrity. Churchill said, oh, you know, Major Attlee, a very fine fellow and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I mean, I think with all of these things, I mean, I always think it with, when you've, when you've spent a lot of time, a lot of sort of hours of your life that you'll never get back again, going through kind of, the, the, the government paperwork, you realize how incredibly tricky a lot of these things are. And there is no magic wand. You know, there was, there was no answer to the in, in, independence question. There, pro there was probably no answer that wouldn't have involved great loss of life. Similarly, there was no magic wand to solve the Bengal famine. You know, you mentioned other controversies. Gallipoli. I think Gallipoli was a, was, was, misguided from the start. I don't think Churchill's solely responsible. I think lots of people have their fingerprints all over it, Fisher, Kitchener, whoever. Sure. Um, but that's the nature of a war. You plan operations, some of them slightly more harebrained than others. This is a very harebrained one. It doesn't work. Lots of people die. But I mean, if you don't want to do that, don't get involved in wars in the first place, because that's, you know, they wanted to end the war quickly. They thought it was a, a they hoped it might be a magic bullet that would knock the Ottoman Empire out of the war. It wasn't. But I mean, that's the nature of the job. I think I think that's the one of the the, the the foolish things about approaching political history and thinking, well, I'm just going to draw up a sort of balance sheet of all the things yes. this particular guy got wrong or he said wrong or that, that he's been on the wrong side of history. Uh, and this will allow me to then give them, a, you know, to, to pronounce sentence, as it were. I think that's a very limiting way of thinking about political leadership, political success, how history works, why politicians matter, all of those kinds of things. And to your point, how history works, um, you know, it, it, it many, I think all of us forget who, who he or she who reads history forgets. The actions taken by individuals at that time, that is there today. It's not, they didn't know six months, 10 right, years, 50 years. They are acting in their reality at that time. So I always tried to, at least for accepting individuals such as Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, um, I always try to give some sort of benefit of the doubt in the sense of trying to understand why actions were taken. Well, um, I mean, and, you know, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that's actually one reason why narrative is actually quite important and why historians who throw out narrative completely do miss something because what narrative gives you is the sense that, you know, tomorrow hasn't happened yet. We're on the 23rd of April, not the 24th. So what do they know at that point in time when the future is uncertain? 
And um, with something like, you know, Gallipoli, let's say, or the Bengal famine, where you're tracing responsibility and you're working out how this thing happens, you know that it's going to be a disaster, but nobody else knows that. And actually telling the story chronologically can sometimes really help you to understand what people, you know, the Watergate question, what did they know and when did they know it? Um, and I think you lose sight of that if you approach it purely retrospectively. Yeah. Well, Dominic, um, let's let's break away here. And uh, so for those attending, I know many of you have, have attended conversations with me. I'm trying out this new thing for our guests. It's called the rapid fire round. Okay. I'm going to have Dominic try to answer these questions in a few words or a short statement. You can already tell I'm capable anything. of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in some really great questions here. So I'd love to get to them before we have to end. So very quickly, Dominic, yeah. champagne or wine? Uh, depends on the wine, but I mean, it depends on the wine. I would say so. So a really good wine, definitely wine. Uh, if it's a sort of bog standard wine, I'd have champagne. Soft cover books or hardcover books when reading? Hardcover. Nuno is Spiritus Santo or Bruno Lage? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a Wolverhampton Wanderers question for those people who don't know. Um, I would actually say Bruno Lage. I love Nuno, but I would say Bruno Lage. Much more entertaining. Uh, yeah. Meryl Streep or Gillian Anderson as Lady Thatcher? Oh, God, that's a terrible question. Do I have to choose one? Um, I suppose I would choose... Um... I suppose I'd choose Meryl Streep, but I mean, very reluctantly. <laughs> do, you, do you think Twitter should include an edit button as, as supported by many people? Uh, I don't, I'm not a massive edit. user of Twitter, but I would say, yes, it should, because you are conscious when you're writing something. Even when I'm publicizing my own podcast, I kind of think if I make a mistake, I'll, I'll look like a fool for all eternity. So, um, so, so yes, it should, it should. Do you think the push to remove statues is ebbing or do you think it will continue to, uh, to flow, if you will? I think it's ebbing because I think it, 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 I hope, well, maybe this is wishful thinking, but I think to a lot of people now, it just looks a little bit laughable when people start laughing at it. Um, uh, but also people are bored, the public are bored of it. They're bored of hearing that everybody was terrible and should be pulled down. I, I mean, that's at least what I hope. If you could serve in the government of one of the following prime ministers, which would you choose? Wilson, second time. Oh. <laughs> Ed Heath or Harold McMillan? Well, Harold McMillan's ministers tended to resign because they were caught in orgies or something. So Harold yes. McMillan's would be, would be would be fun. Um, and I would have gone if I mean to serve in Harold McMillan's government, I would have had to have gone to Eton mm -hmm. and wear a massive, massively sort of um, over hot tweed suit. So so that has its appeal. Um, I think I'm probably in personality. I'm probably more of a Wilson too, a sort of shabby. Yes. Seen better days. Paranoid. Paranoid, overeducated, um, and a bit, you know, just a bit at sea. Um, the, order, the sort of the management of decline, that would be, that, I'd, I'd enjoy that. Yeah. So last question, very similar. Which president's cabinet would you serve in? Nixon, Reagan, or Johnson? Well, Johnson had this habit, didn't he, of, um, of humiliating his associates sort of making them come and talk to him while he was on the toilet and so on so johnson is a definite no and obviously i'd have vietnam hanging over me um reagan reagan didn't recognize many of his own cabinet so um it would be undemanding i suppose you could say i could send a substitute to the meetings uh nixon i'd be worried about henry kissinger bugging me um but on the other hand i I mean, Nixon also treated his cabinet with contempt, like poor old William Rogers, his Secretary of State. So, I suppose Nixon just for the sort of the um, the sort of voyeurism side yes. of things. Yeah, I, I, Nick, it's got to be Nixon, hasn't it? Really, you, you want right. to, I'd be, I'd be able to publish a Watergate memoir. Um, yeah, you'd the be Richard Nixon with, I knew. A, with a criminal conspiracy. Right, exactly. Yeah, I'd be well. Up, I'd, be, I'd have been well up for all those sort of Gordon Liddy meetings and so on. <laughs> Okay, so let's get to these great questions. And, and, you know, obviously many of them are Churchill and that's why we have you on here, but thank you for doing that. I think it gave, I see I see uh, Steve Tepperman actually shouting for Nuno, which I think is a very, very unpopular opinion. Um, uh, and actually, you know what, Peter D. Uh, so yeah. his quick fire question, your favorite book that you write, favorite book that you wrote. 
Uh, so see. I wrote a book that wasn't as probably as as it wasn't as long anyway. It definitely and it probably wasn't as successful as some other books. It was called the Great Great British Dream Factory. It was basically a TV tie-in that got out of control. And um, it was a book about um, the British imagination, the modern British imagination. So it's a book about Agatha Christie, about um, the Beatles, Doctor Who, about all these sort of things that Britain, Britain is ex- Tolkien, the Britain has exported it. And I wrote it in a very, in a great rush in a, um, and it was sort of quite self-indulgent, but I really enjoyed doing it for that reason. Of the more mainstream books that I've done, definitely Who Dares Wins, which is the book about the early Thatcher years. Because Thatcher's a great character, actually like Churchill. She's just a great character to write about, whatever you think about her. But also writing about the Falklands War, writing about the the, the huge kind of gear shift of the early 80s. I love doing that. So, uh, Dominic, it's a question from Stephen Shore. Feel free not to, if you don't want to answer it. But the question is, will you comment on Jeffrey Weecroft's book, Churchill Shadow? I'd be happy to, but I'll, I'll ask you if you want to comment. No, I reviewed, I reviewed that book for the Sunday Times. Oh, you did? Um, I I sort of had had very mixed feelings about it because I really I like Jeffrey Recroft as a writer. He's a veteran mm-hmm. journalist. Um, I I enjoyed, as I sort of said, I think in the review, I disagreed with it very strongly, but I enjoyed disagreeing with it. So um, I, I I thought he was just he wrote in this sort of slightly self-flagellating way. You know, Britain has been completely distorted by its ad- adoption of the Churchill myth and. You know, this is what lies behind Brexit and our false sense of, you know, we should basically be Belgium, all this kind of stuff. And it's Churchill, all Churchill's fault and our veneration of Churchill. And I completely disagree with all that. I think that's that's an absurd view to take, frankly. But I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it. I, I never am one of these people who thinks that just because I don't agree with the book, it must be a bad book. Um, I, I had, I, I, listen, I've read, I've reviewed a lot of very boring books that I might have agreed with more, but I his book was not boring. Fascinating. That's a fascinating uh, interpretation on this. So um, allow me to move to, um, so oh, this is a good question from George Webb. Aside, aside from his Churchill's political and historical achievements, two aspects of Churchill that his mar- admirers cherish um, are his humor and his zest for life. To what extent can, can or do those qualities burnish his reputation for the long-term are those qualities considered passe as well? No, I think those qualities stand him in very good stead. So the the sense of humour and the the zest for life, I think, are what strike anybody who 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 reads about Churchill. Um, it makes him, you know, I mentioned writing about Mrs. Thatcher earlier on. What made her a great character to write about was this sort of sense of blazing moralistic passion which marked her out as different from the sort of more careworn prime ministers like Macmillan, Wilson, Heath that I'd written about before. With Churchill, I think it is, as you know, as as many of you will know, it is this large, this this deliberately, self-consciously larger than life, good humoured, center, incredibly sentimental, you know, weeping buckets, bricklaying, painting, cavalry charging persona. And I think if you're, I, I'm always, all the people who say, well, I can't stand Churchill, I don't, I find him this, that, the other. I sort of think he's utterly irrepressible. I mean, it's like saying you don't like Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson, another great British kind of self-invented character, self-conscious character. And of course, I'm sure such people could be very wearing to be around. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, I'm sure there were people whose hearts sank when they saw Churchill coming in for dinner. They thought, oh, he'll just be telling endless anecdotes about himself and, you know, his his much polished quips and all this kind of Christ, you know, we're going have a proper conversation. But he must have been magnetic company. And I think when you're reading a, a good book about Churchill, he's magnetic company even then. So that for that reason, I think that long after all those controversies and things that we were just talking about, Gallipoli or, you know, the gold standard, I mean, who's going to care about that in the 24th century? Nobody. What they will care about, though, is the personality that leaps off the page. Um, and I think that's that's what makes him a great historical character. It's not just the role as the saviour of his country, as A.J.P. Taylor sure. put it. But, it, but it's also, as you say, it's the humour and the zest and the love of life. Um, and I think if you if you like humanity, you can't help but like Churchill. That's a great line. And his curiosity, I always tell people, they say, what is, what is your favourite quote? Well, my favourite part of Churchill is his personal courage. After Gallipoli, what did he do? He resigned. He served yeah. in the front yeah. for four months. 
what politician today would go to the front line right. of the Western right. Front and, and actually go over the top many times? Yeah. Uh, actually, you second, know what? I was going to say, I know lots of people in the comments have been talking about Zelensky. Zelensky as a sort of Churchillian yeah. figure. And actually, it's the courage, isn't it? With It's, it's the courage and the, and, the, and the personal story and the humanity that makes Zelensky feel Churchillian. I think and yeah, that, the bravery under fire. I mean, that's something that you don't see from most politicians. No, in his line to, to President Biden, I don't need a ride, I need ammo. I mean, that's that's almost pulled from Churchill's line to uh, to um, uh, to you didn't say it specifically to FDR, but he was speaking to FDR. Give us the tools and we'll finish the job. I yeah. mean, that that is is almost pulled from the script. I would really like to uh, ask a question from Alexander Jackson, which is a slightly adversarial question, but Alexander, we appreciate your time. Seriously, we appreciate your question. And I'll, I'll, I'll truncate this a little bit. She, she asks, why is it impossible to have this conversation without everyone defending Churchill so much? And I, you know, I, I can answer, but I'd be happy to, I'd be happy if you wanted to take a stab at, at trying to understand what she's asking. So why, why do you, would you, why is it impossible to have a conversation about people defending Churchill? Yes, and at, and at what point does revisiting a, a previously revered figure become acceptable? Although I oh, still think oh. he is revered. Uh, so I think it's always reasonable to to reassess figures. I mean, otherwise history comes to an end. You know, you you know, I think that's absolutely reasonable. But I think. I mean, first of all, I don't think attack and defense are the best ways to talk about historical personalities. I think that's um, a very fair point. And I think, so in other words, I think if we said, well, let's have a conversation about Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great or somebody, I mean, people, you know, with the blood of thousands of people on their hands, yeah. um, yeah. a, a, attack and defense would be weird to my mind. I mean, it's sort of not a very interesting conversation. Because the interesting conversation is how do they acquire power? What do they do with it? What do they think they were doing? What impact did they have? All those kinds of things, not the sort of hanging judge. So um, so to, I suppose the reason that people leap to Churchill's defense is part is sometimes because they think, so in my case, it, it would be more that I think attack is just a, a pointless, I think attacking somebody who can't answer back, they're dead, holding them to the judgment of, of, the, of modernity when they lived in a different age, all of those kinds of things. It's not just that I think it's it's unfair or whatever, or that it or that it, or that it, and it's not just that it 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 rests on the premise that we are in somehow in this incredibly well position to judge, which I don't think we we are morally speaking, but I just actually don't think it's interesting. I don't think it's the most interesting way of so it's somewhat like Churchill, as we said. Obviously, I mean he's flawed because he's a human being. I don't think he's more flawed than and lots of other people are. But he has flaws and he makes mistakes. But just to sort of to, to, to get into this kind of balance sheet thing, I just don't think it's very interesting. So the def it's not so much that I think if somebody sort of says, oh, you want to go and defend church, it's not that I really want to defend him. It's that I think it's much more interesting to talk about him in the round without any of the moralistic judgment. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Andy Smith. Hopefully this is good friend Andy Smith, executive director of ICS in the UK. So he, so he knows your historian and he's asking, what is your assessment of Churchill as a historian if you've read Churchill's uh, many tens of yeah. thousands of work? Well, I can't say I've read them all. I used to have a copy of <laughs> an abridged kind of kids version of the history of the, or teenagers version of the history of the English speaking peoples, um, which I enjoyed very much because I was a real sucker for that sort of um, swashbuckling kind of romantic narrative i think that's what churchill does very well actually in those books i mean he obviously has the he obviously had a lot of assistance we all know that um tons of different people kind of worked on his various um his various books uh but they all had that kind of churchillian flavor didn't they the kind of cadences that we all recognize and he had a very distinctive view of history as history is made by basically men like him um and uh yes I, I, but there's a there is a there is a relish I think to the way Churchill writes about history that makes it I mean even if it is very terribly dated and um, partisan and, and all those kinds of things it's it's pleasurable it's enormously pleasurable yes and um, yeah I mean he's, he's, it would obviously be absurd to claim he's one of the great historians of of, of history um, but but uh, he's fun his history books are fun. And um, I think actually fun is greatly under underrated 
as a sort yeah. of literary quality. <laughs> there was a there was a, a detractor of his what that recently said, which I think is unfair, but it, it I have to admit give you uh, give me a chuckle. Um, he said um, Churchill. Someone reminded him that Churchill won the Nobel Prize for literature, and, and he replied, "Well, they usually give it out to fiction." <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, it's very good. Very good. I thought, well, I mean, yeah, there is an element of that. Having said all play. that, you know, talking about politicians' books, I've read a lot of books by politicians. I've read, I've read, and reviewed um, a biography of Winston Churchill by Churchill's best-known current political admirer, which mm. was, I thought, was absolutely abysmal compared with Churchill's own books. And I also had the um, misfortune of reading Jacob Rees-Mogg's book, um, *The Victorians*, which I think I said at the time was the worst history book I'd ever read. So most British politicians have a terrible record of writing history books and Churchill by those standards is positively stellar. Yes. Yes. I, I'm, I, I think I know who you're referring to in terms of that, in terms of that author. So just one or two more questions, Dominic, thank you for your yeah. time. I know it's in the evening for you. No, no, no. Um, uh, you know, Eugene, uh, no, here, let me ask this question. I'm finding it now. Excuse me one moment. So this is from anonymous. Isn't okay. all history generally a question of and a matter of opinion? I'll shrink it to that. Can you uh, be truly objective with your history? No, no, you can't. Um, I, you absolutely can't. Uh, history is a literary, a literary creation, which means it has to have a creator. Um, in other yes. words, uh, a work of history is, is written just as much as a work of fiction is. It's constructed. The examples are chosen. Um, so I think objectivity is always the wrong word. Um, and I, I used to I used to have a much more sophisticated take on this because I used to teach a, um, a second in English university second year course about historiography, which I even myself found quite boring. So God knows what the students thought about it. But we used to have spend ages arguing about objectivity. My view now is that basically history should be you should try to be fair. Uh, it's as simple as that. You should try to be reasonably fair minded. So when you introduce your various characters, you should try to you know, give them the benefit of the doubt where possible. I mean, obviously, there'll be some you like more than others. There'll be there'll be there'll be things you bring to it. You'll be an interpretation. There'll be an ideological. You know, you'll see it through your own ideological prism. But the best you can do is to be aware of that. To know that you're ideological. To know that you are situated somewhere, and to be reflective about that. To be open with the reader and sort of say to the reader, "Well, this is who and where I am. This is what I see from where I'm standing." But other people standing somewhere else would see it differently. And I think that means that um, you can read a Marxist historian, a very right wing historian, if they're open about that, you can read them with great pleasure and interest and, and gain a lot from it, not necessarily agree with them. Um, but you won't say, oh, they were terribly, you know, the fact that they're open about their lack of objectivity, I think, yes. is, 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 is fine, actually. History is a debate. Um, and if you're open about that, and if you sort of say, if you're pluralistic, I suppose that's what it is. In other words, when I write about Mrs. Thatcher's Britain. I know that mine is not the only version that somebody could have a really good, completely different take on it using totally different case studies, examples, whatever. Um, and their interpretation might be completely different. doesn't mean they're wrong and I'm right or vice versa. They, they may be, as long as they're true to the archival evidence and as long as they are, they try to be balanced and reasonable and honest, then I think there's, there's nothing wrong with it. Archival evidence, I will say, a uh, great friend and, and uh, huge stalwart in the Churchill world, Alan Packwood, director of the Archive Center, mm. always says, he says, what we have here is the evidence. Let the evidence speak. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a, 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 the archival evidence are, the, of course, the bedrock. But to your, to your point, debates then come from interpretation. Um, and, and, and shouldn't be, and it's maybe more accessible for some people who don't, you know, who think history is boring. Maybe that is a more accessible way of, of understanding history. Um, so last two questions. This is from Ta Rob, Robin Taylor, other than Thatcher, is there any prime minister likely to receive a state or ceremonial funeral in your opinion? Uh, no, I think, um, Tony Blair might be an obvious contender, but I don't think he would want one. And I think that he would, it's really interesting, the contrast between Blair and Thatcher, because obviously Thatcher was tremendously controversial in, in her lifetime and afterwards. Um, but Blair is, the difference is that people who liked, who voted for Thatcher continued to adore her, whereas those who didn't absolutely despised her. In Blair's case, 
it's actually a lot of the people who voted for him who now regard him as the sort of devil incarnate. So I don't know what who the who the constituency would be. The sort of small dwindling constituency of centrist dads, as I believe they're called on <laughs> social media, um, uh, who would support a sort of Blair. But I don't think Blair would want it himself. Actually, I think he would be uneasy with the idea of a, a state or, or ceremonial funeral. Um, no, but I don't think there is a. I mean, most prime ministers end up kind of regressing into more or less obscurity. Actually, I think of someone like Harold Wilson, who won lots of elections destroyed British politics in the 1960s and 1970s and basically was a forgotten man by yeah. the time he died. How did you think the portrayal of him in The Crown was? Was that accurate? I didn't know much about him before that. Uh, it was better than the Thatcher. <laughs> um, that's yeah. not saying very much. It wasn't bad, actually. He's a very good actor, the guy who does Wilson, Jason Watkins. Um, yes. The, the, the Crown for me, I mean, I, I was a very very much a Crown sceptic until a national newspaper persuaded me to watch it for article writing purposes. And I thought the first, the initial um, episodes, sort of Eden and so on, and George VI, um, I really enjoyed those. I think because yes. they were far enough away that people weren't doing impersonations and it wasn't caricature. But by the time, certainly by the time Mrs. Thatcher, Gillian Anderson kind of hove into view, I mean, I thought that was basically an, an, an impersonation of an impersonation of an impersonation. Um, so, so by those standards, the Wilson wasn't too bad. Yeah. All right. Last question. Is there this is from Matthew? Love it. Is there a historical figure that Dominic thinks should be talked about more? Well, people who listen to the rest of history our podcast will know that that historical figure is Stanley Baldwin. Now, um, <laughs> Stanley Baldwin. And Churchill obviously had a very interesting relationship because yes, they did. Uh, Churchill worked for Baldwin, and, but then was extremely mean about him later on. But again, I think actually this is a classic example of where Churchill's remarks are perhaps taken a bit out of context. So Churchill famously oh, that's never happened before. So Churchill famously used to, you know, there was this sort of story that Churchill, when he's playing chess, would say to people where they got at their pawns, he would say, "Get out your Baldwins," and and also there's this sort of he said so later on, didn't he? Um, I wish Stanley Baldwin no ill, but it would be better if he had never lived. I mean, that's, that that that's an extraordinary. I don't believe that really represents Churchill's feelings about Baldwin okay. because Churchill knew that Baldwin was in a fantastically kind of canny and feline operator. And I also think that Baldwin should be talked about more because Baldwin is by far the politician in my mind who dominates Britain between the two world wars. He creates, in some ways, the modern party system by basically crushing the liberals and situating the Tories as the anti-socialist party. He, in some ways, he creates the Tories as a modern political party using the power of the media, but also appealing to the new suburbs and so on. But also Baldwin completely incarnates this thing that's very successful in British politics, which is the sort of deliberately nostalgic, reassuring, you know, small C conservative. Also um, sleep. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think yeah. I think he's really interesting as a political figure, and um, he's absolutely the person that should be should be spoken about more. Well, I wasn't expecting that, but now that you bring it up, of course, yeah, it seems like Baldwin and Alexander the Great are your two. Uh, uh, um, yeah, you know, you guys talk about them the most. My that they they well, we sometimes talk about James Callaghan, um, Labour, who I think is greatly underestimated Labour Prime Minister in the late 70s. Unfortunately, he presided over the winter of discontent, which was something of a disaster of his reputation. But I was really like James Callaghan, because you mentioned Harold Wilson. They're the two sort of 70s Labour Prime Ministers, and Wilson gets all the credit, and everybody forgets that Callaghan even existed, and I think that's completely wrong. Yeah. Well, Dominic, thank you for your time. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. Uh, uh, and for those listening, this will be posted on our YouTube page. Thank you again, Dominic. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your wonderful yeah. questions. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Take care. You too.